Doktor Tolga Yerbitas, Tolga is the professor assistant associate with the <laughs> professor at Imperial College London. And um, he did his PhD in TUM with Master Noah, and then he moved to Stanford for his postdoc. Um, Tolga has done amazing work in topological machine learning and 3D computer vision. If you probably worked on Point Plus, it's impossible not to hear his name. Um, he publishes on top tier conferences in our field, both machine learning and computer vision. If you go to one of these conferences, you will probably run into him. He's usually part of the fun meetups organizations like at last at Europe's last month, last week, not last month. Um, Tolga will talk about topological deep learning and info for AI for science today. All the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you. Well, by the way, last, last week was my birthday, so that's, that's birthday. why it was also like a yeah. special. I missed it, but I had a yeah, I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm really excited to be with you guys because, like, with some of the folks we work together, and I never had the chance to interact physically uh, beyond conferences, so it's actually amazing. Like, amazing. Uh, thanks for the invite. Okay, so um, we start with this. Effort with a bunch of people. I think that uh, so there, there were, I think, in the original paper, 14 authors or so. I didn't put the link of the paper, which is a shame. Uh, but uh, sorry, I, I can send the, send the paper. To you. I think you have it in the email. Um, well, uh, we, co we collaborated on this with, with a bunch of people from mathematics and, uh, and, and cognitive science. Uh, some of them are uh, are great in uh, you know topics like invariances, so they work in mathematics on representation theory mostly. And some of them are great in uh, in topology. And some of them remain in geometry, and uh, you know, and so on and so forth. And I don't know what I'm good at, so I'm like uh, anywhere in between these guys. Um, the core effort has been led by Mustafa, Nina, uh, myself, and Gada. Um, and I'm Michael. Uh, so, and, and we are right now trying to organize a lot of uh, workshops and trying to put a lot of efforts uh, on this topic. And this is actually the second time I'm talking about this. But last week I learned that our CVPR workshop has been accepted. So I think uh, you will hear uh, way more. So, um, unfortunately, I will be using the board a little bit. So I'm 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 very sorry for the faults uh, in Zoom. Um, they can see. It. They can see it. Can see it okay, good. Also. So if if you want to switch to my camera, that would be okay. Um. So what do we want to do in machine learning most of the time, right? So so here is what we what we stupidly want to do. So we have let's say a universe of machine learning models. We usually call this the hypothesis class. Set of all hypotheses possible. These would include different architecture. So part of this hypothesis class would be, for example, SVMs. A part of this would be, I don't know, GMMs, whatever machine learning model uh, you work with uh, is in there. And think of this giant, giant thing, uh, you know, uh, infinite size. And then here uh, in one corner, there is uh, deep learning, which we all do now, uh, right? So deep models, I should say. And <clears throat> this class, um, we usually have architectures. So uh, most of it is, is composed of, let's say, different architectures. Let's say this, this architecture spans this region, and then there's an, another architecture that spans this region. Um, so you have a bunch of possible architectures, in fact, possibly infinite. Um, and within each architecture, you have the model parameters. So you change the model parameters, you get another hypothesis, right? So imagine this huge space. Now, in that space, Let's say you are doing deep learning, right? And uh, you specify yourself to a certain architecture most of the time, um, which is a bad idea. But still, you start from a point here because your, your weights uh, are randomly initialized. Let's say uh, theta zero somehow comes from some kind of an interesting uh, distribution. Um, and then you want to find your way to this, hopefully the best model uh, you can find that will fit your data perfectly, right? And this is a challenging problem, as you all know, because uh, the number of parameters in your model is you know, super large, and uh, there are all sorts of caveats. Maybe your loss function is not modeling the reality correctly, and so on and so forth. 
there is the generalization issue and and whatnot, right? And so what you want to do, you want to put a lot of inductive biases. And what are the inductive biases that, that we actually do? What do they do? So they in fact restrict the, the possible hypothesis class, right? So what, what you're doing, let's say instead of starting at this point, if I impose some kind of a constraint on my variables, then maybe I will be starting at another point and then it will be easier to move. So let's say I will maybe restrict the region um, such that the, the best model remaining inside this region. But I can only do this um, as I see the training data. And as you see on the slide, and um, so if there, for example, there's this pop population loss, what, what, what people call the RF. Okay, this is usually an expectation, so usually an integral, and um, that's population loss. And that is saying that if you have all the data in the world, if you have seen everything, that would be the loss you attend. Okay. And that includes, of course, your test data, your training data, and all sorts of other data that you could possibly see. And then there's the empirical loss. It's, that's the empirical risk, right? And then the empirical risk is some kind of an estimate of R, um, given that hypothesis. So, um, and, and to, to get that estimate, you sample randomly a batch of data, or you collect a batch of data, and then you evaluate this loss function. So to train, you need this training data. So what you have access to is this. You never know what that is, okay? Um, but you hope that just by training on this, using this risk, <clears throat> you get some kind of a, well, just, just by training, let's say, on, on a finite set of data, you get an empirical loss that is close to the, to the real loss on any sorts of data. Okay. Um, well, again, challenging problem. So to make that happen, uh, you kind of want to put a lot of price. So you see that this is uncomfortable, by the way. And, uh, you know, some part of a supreme of this or people do it different ways um, can be linked to a generalization, what is called the generalization error, right? So basically what you train is, is this, but at the same time, you want this quantity to be small as well. And yeah, so that's a paradox in deep learning. So this is what the, the elder machine learning people work on. Of course, you know, what, what, what type of priors do we have? Like, or what type of regularization uh, do we have for, for data, right? Uh, one is, for example, that you would know, I assume, or, or I'm, I'm going to force my, my weights to be Lipschitz or I'm going to force some kind of a weight decay on this. Or I'm going to say it's a, you know, or, or, or whatever, there are so many norms and things like that. But um, at this stage, um, you know, geometric deep learning was introduced and it said, well, I know a lot of priors about the world, right? Uh, I know what I'm looking for. So if I'm trying to solve for certain variables, let's say I'm trying to solve for an angle, I know what an angle looks like mathematically. Right? If I want to solve a rotation, I know what a rotation looks like. So I am going to bake these transformations into the network to, to get better inductive biases. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing it said was to decompose the domain from the signal and the and the, the transformations that act on this domain. So basically, if, if, if the object is being rotated and if you still want to classify the cat as a cat, right, then you want to do this uh, decoupling or disentanglement of these things, not like a CNN. In fact, this typical CNN would have implicit, would have implicit uh, separation of these things and it would be, uh, for example, translation equivalent, right? Um, but you could, you could think about other forms of equivalences. Right, and by that, your domain, right, which is usually the, for, for an image, for example, it would be the pixels, the arranged in, in a grid, in a lattice. But then they suddenly realize that this can be, this can be anything other than, this, this just looks like a graph, 
and I can in fact choose it as a graph. And since my uh, representation uh, of the you know transformations are, uh, are disentangled from this, now I can uh, have some kind of a nice mathematical uh, framework for uh, processing graphs in an equivalent manner. And that was known as uh, geometric deep learning. And there's a book called Five Gs of uh, GDL and so on and so forth. Right? And then you try to design models that uh, take that into account. Okay? Now, there are unfortunately some problems with it because the data domains, although uh, GDL spans a, a, a nice spectrum of data domains, um, it's still a little um, limited, okay? It, it's because we really have arbitrary data domains and some of them uh, are not graph represented. In fact, um, GDL is really good when you know the, when you know that the underlying structure is some kind of the underlying object admits some kind of a global structure. So let's say the sphere can be discretized into a graph. You still know the global structure of this. Or the image itself is maybe a continuous plane, but I can sample points on it and that's going to be the pixel grid. And that's really good. But the most uh, widely used structure, which is a graph, does not have such a global um, geometric model. And then, you know, sometimes, of course, you want to do things locally. But it's also very hard, uh, you know, in a, in a continuous way uh, to assign charts uh, locally at, at times. Okay. So instead, we switch our attention to neighborhoods and open set structures. That is how um, the topological considerations begin in this way. And um, you know, you look at the graph, any graph, and it looks like uh, there's there's kind of a little neighborhood, a discrete neighborhood around it. Of course, if you kind of uh, increase your resolution, you go finer and finer, you end up in some kind of a continuous uh, neighborhood. So, why we do this is, is there's a reason for it because we would like to model, uh, and I will talk about this a lot. Um, higher order structures. So when I say this, by the way, who understands what that would be? And, and I'm asking this for a reason. Anyone? No, right? So because this is something we generally ignore uh, in, in a lot of machine learning problems. Um, So usually we, we work with the graph and we quite believe that the graph is a beautiful representation for anything in the world. Social networks, um, right, the images itself, the image itself or you know, anything, uh, the traffic flows and, and everything, right? And then we use graph neural networks for this. So, but let's look at the, very basic structure. Let's 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 construct, for example, our social network. Um, I will just say here at this node is a mother that is in some kind of a relationship with the father. Okay. And as a result of this beautiful relationship, they get a son. Okay. Now, son is of course connected to mother in some, some point of relationship, and also connected to, to father, whatever their relationship would be. But now these two and three entities come together, and you suddenly call this a family. And why do you call this a family? Because this, the relationship of these three things, of, the, or, or of these three people, aren't just the relationship, the, these pairwise relationships put in a bag. They form this kind of new relationship that is a family that is actually the, the inside of this triangle sphere. So any single social network you think, well, by the way, triangles with field structures cannot be represented by graphs. 
And so anything, you know, any social networks that are in the graph, and you can think of other things. Like, in fact, this is this is true for all not anything. Let's say uh, you, you start playing music and you kind of play the guitar, right? And then somebody comes, the, you know, the, the bass guitar comes, right? And the bass guitar is playing in tune with whatever you are playing. So you are kind of synchronized and you build a relationship. And then the drums come and, you know, it's, it's also in the, you know, kind of in the same metronome. Now, 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 of course, uh, is in tune with bass, is in tune with guitar, and, and you kind of suddenly have, a, have another new relationship. So you just generalize this very little. And it's in fact known as the, the synergy. Right? This, is, this is a result of synergy. And synergy says the sum of the parts or, or the whole is larger than the sum of its parts. Right? So you fuse these pairwise information, and suddenly you get an information that is not. Uh, contained in any of these uh, relationships. So, Paul, what about hypergraphs? So, can it be treated so, as yeah. like a so this is this, for now, this sounds like a hypergraph, and thinking as a hypergraph is perfectly fine for the moment. Uh, and, and I will touch upon it later. Okay, so uh, you get the idea that now, now we, want, we would like to more like. Model these structures. I mean, this is this is contained in the data. It is not that uh, that we don't have it. Usually, simplifying this to a graph, you you kind of lose information. You neglect that information for the sake of you know computationally tractable processing, for example. Um, but we don't want to do that. We actually want to keep these relationships. And for example, hypergraphs uh, would be one way uh, to do that. Um, but I will come in a second why this would be the case. So. There are all sorts of other mathematical objects uh, in the world, and uh, we would like to have possibly something, some some kind of a mechanism that does not distinguish anymore um, these structures and is truly universal. Okay. And by the way, one uh, easy example for computer graphics people: if you look at meshes, for example, meshes are not graphs. Meshes are composed. Uh, uh, by triangles and triangles themselves are actually meaningful, right? Or triangle meshes at least. But or, or tetrahedral meshes are composed of tetrahedral elements and they are meaningful by themselves. Um, so in that regard, for now, in, even in 3D vision, what we have, we have a point cloud, right? Which is just a vertex. Okay. We have a, a graph which is vertex and an edge. And then we have the triangle, which usually has the notion of vertex and triangles. This is how you would store it. But I would say there is, there is usually a common misconception because we consider the triangle as something that connects three vertices. This is not really true. A triangle actually connects three edges. Because, because, well, there is a flow from this edge because the triangle is filled in. There's a flow from this edge to this edge without touching any vertex, right? And vertex are, is, is just kind of the end point uh, of that edge. So, um, you know, at least the topology is speaking. And this happens a lot, um, for example, in, in, in practice. Like if you want to model particle interactions in fluid dynamics, uh, or if you want to model how a cloth, if I, if I pull this, how it's going to deform. Uh, well, it's not that vertices interact and they kind of uh, result in uh, some kind of uh, dynamics, but it's rather how the, the states of individual edges affect the state of other edges, right? So there is, there is an edge, there's an edge to edge impact that is impossible to model with a graph because graphs model vertex to vertex relationships. Or not to not relationships. That kind of binary. And then comes the applications in science. So, um, for example, if you would like to model proteins, well, you could go with hypergraphs, but hypergraphs uh, are kind of, you know, they, they are, they, they go these set type of relationships and they, they totally lose the meaning of individual uh, cells. So, the moment you abstract certain words, certain nodes to a hypernode, but you say, okay, this hypernode is just a node. I'm just going to treat this as a node. 
although it is really at a higher level in a hierarchy. So the moment we do this, you kind of lose the meaning of uh, what certain uh, proteins would be. Um, people came up with different things. For example, they came up with simplicial complex complexes, right? And, and you see there, uh, but, but they have a, a limited representation. There you see that they, they represent the triangles only. Um, at this at this part, and then these triangles, of course, uh, are not everything. They they are not the the molecules themselves. Or uh, you could go set it to some something called a cellular complex, which could go beyond triangles and have faces that are not triangular, so you know polygonal faces and so on. Um, and this has more. This is more expressive, more representation power, but also not completely uh, faithful. But so we introduced something called on the on the right hand side combinatorial complexes, which are really combinatorial structures. They are that are like hypergraphs, but preserve the rank structures. And I will talk about this uh, in. So, of course, uh, why we would do all of these things, right? Uh, it's a big problem. For example, uh, in today's world, that we would like to do drug discovery. Everyone is working on this problem, and if you follow the nerves a little bit is it's proteins everywhere and so what happens is uh, you have k drugs and then there is like some some binding sites i don't know so there, there could be some virus uh, or, or there could be some molecule that you want to attach to and then you you really would like to predict the sites the the, the, the sites and, and and their effects uh, on this you know kind of protein to drug interaction space. Okay, and this space is actually really a high order. It's, a, it's the relationships of relationships that count and, and not, the, not just the pay-wise relationships. So if you want to model um, cognition, so if you want to look at the areas of, of the brain that are responsible for a higher level cognition, we in fact see immediately that there are, uh, so this is, I did not cite it, but comes from a neuroscience paper. And um, we immediately see that uh, there are activations across. So also this happens also in a neural network, by the way. So the, the neurons that fire together, they belong to different regions of space and they create this higher order um, elements, right? Um, and in fact, you can gradually see this. So the, the low level tasks such as auditory processing are occurring in these, you know, they say sub circuits that look like graphs because these are low level tasks. But the moment you, you complexify the task and you go to higher level cognition, you see that there are jumps across regions and then the things that fire together are, are really interesting and, uh, and cannot just be simplified to graphs. And people have been doing that in neuroscience for years. And in fact, it's like 2021 paper, but now it's coming more and more and that they want to do um, higher order modeling or understanding uh, how brain functions. So in this case, what is the precise complex that you consider? If you have like N neurons firing together, then they form an N simplex, is that the... For example. Mm -hmm. and I, I mean, in fact, what happens here is you have N, which is a very large number of neurons, and then you have a stimulus, and then, then you kind of look at how the neurons uh, activate for different stimuli, and you see that there are certain patterns that some of them kind of uh, activate together, right? And the, the things that activate are, are in different kind of stronger relationships than just pairwise relationships, obviously. And uh, in fact, this, all, this, this order is really high. Um, another good part about having access to higher order structures is when you have a graph, let's say, and you want to message pass, you want to pass information from one point to a distant point. And when you do this in the graph, right? Uh, for example, Michael Bronstein always uh, works on this. What happens is over smoothing and over squashing. So it is you kind of gradually uh, pass information in, along the layers or you know to, to different uh, nodes. Uh, you kind of smooth that information, and, and this is a problem. And this offers a very easy fix to that, of course, by increasing the dimension at the cost of increasing the dimension. So you kind of 
make up this higher order cell. And instead of trying to pass information along edges, you pass the information from every single vertex or edge uh, to this higher order cell, right? And you aggregate the information within that higher order cell and pass it back. If you do that, um, the, the effects of over smoothing um, are greatly reduced. Okay, so I will also check that. Um, it's just one level of hierarchy. What the multiple yeah. so. yes, I will so so um right so now now you know now you see my goal. My goal is to kind of generalize the traditional domains of point clouds and graphs and to you know general topologies and what you can do is you could use uh the but of course the traditional domains are the discrete domains at least are point clouds and graphs and meshes, but meshes. This is strange because people were trying to find mesh networks um, just by themselves. Like there is this mesh diffusion, mesh net, uh, mesh form net, uh, whatever, right? All these architectures. And the reason why they, they are trying to learn on meshes is because meshes are not graphs and they want to come find, find these uh, you know, mesh architectures. But now, if, let's forget about this. You've got to find something more general. I don't care if it's a mesh or a even higher order. But while doing that, uh, I do not want to lose the hierarchical information. So if I I, want, I say, you know, that, that I'm at a certain point of hierarchy, I would like to know that. So a hypergraph would be noise. So we kind of want to blend the, the space of uh, complexes that mathematicians or topologists know very well, by the way, and with the world of hypergraphs. And by doing so, we would like to architect uh, some kind of a deep learning orders. Like there's the data domain, which I would model as a topological space. And then I would define a lot of operations like convolutions and pooling and attention and whatnot uh, on this and message passing in general, of course. And, uh, and then in the end, you have your final task, uh, loss function, whatever you would like to achieve. Be interesting. Part comes here, I think that's a, a little you know hidden, but it's like a crux of it. If you do that, if you can really, really do that correctly, you could pass information from edges to vertices, edges to triangles, vertices to triangles, or um, you know, so so you see, like think of this as a message passing scenario in a graph, you would pass message from this guy to this guy over the edge. Right, uh, but now you are you, you are given a higher order cell, which is a triangle that is that is kind of an inner meaning, and now you could actually pass information um, from this edge to this vertex, from this edge to the other edge, from this edge to the triangle itself, and these are all meaningful uh, elements, and this is happening during message passing, for example. And that means you can share information in all sorts of interesting ways. Are there different types of messages? Uh, for us, no. But you could, I can imagine that these messages are very interesting. So, just like there's a blueprint of geometric deep learning, let me also give you a blueprint of deep learning. And this kind of summarizes what I have talked about so far. So, first, you start with a set of elements, right? that are independent of how the relationships are constructed. And then you have to kind of construct a neighborhood structure, which defines how the relationships uh, are, are made. It's the second stage. The moment you do this, uh, now, now if, if our framework is general enough, then you are in the setting of graph-like learning, which means that uh, you can use these strange neighborhood information uh, to pass messages. Uh, here and there. And then you, you, you define your message passing. And in the end, uh, of course, you kind of uh, define your pooling operations and stuff. So you increase your receptive field size and, you know, apply all the deep learning stuff uh, that you, you know. Okay. So again, the idea is to unite the higher order domains and the domains of uh, geometric deep learning. Um, and come up with a new structure that would uh, rule them all and then define uh, 
and neural architectures. Mm -hmm. It's a bit early to worry about science like crazy, right? Like, is it too early to worry about science fiction? It's a bit early to worry about science fiction. No, I mean, uh, there are ways to sparse, just like you would sparse by graph, you would also sparsify it. You wouldn't just consider every single uh, higher order cell, but you would consider the ones that are critical and stuff like that. But it's a research topic by itself. By itself so. Okay. So the differences, like as you see on the slide, um, there in the graph, you have this bipartite relationship between the vertices and edges, right? So you can think of the edges as a set, the vertices as a set, and then the graph will define the this, you know, connections and then you specify which vertex is actually a part of which edge. Now, if you have a hypergraph, you could do the same, right? It's just that now your edge set, uh, but it's kind of a little high order, and then is these hyper edges. Uh, you can connect your vertices to these hyper edges. In a cell complex, and this is what I really mean by the hierarchy itself, you kind of have this uh, intermediate uh, um, type of uh, intermediate layer where everything gets connected, uh, which is called a cell, and then uh, you go to two cells. So this hierarchical information is kind of preserved uh, in what is called a cell complex. Okay, so let's say. Uh, one, two, three is actually a part of uh, a triangle that you see there. And then uh, two, three, four, five um, is, is part of another cell. But at the same time, uh, two and five share an edge for it. So it's a hierarchical structure. Now, in what we offer, um, you see that now suddenly there are these edges and, and they are colored differently. And different color means that they are in, living in the different level of the hierarchy, right? So three is 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 a rank zero cell, which is like a you know no connection, and rank one cell uh, is basically connected by an edge. Rank two cell is like a triangle. Of course, you don't need to think about this as a triangle. You can think of an abstract relationship of the uh, elements one two three, and then um, just like in just like in graphs, you could speak of some matrices. That are, these are known as boundary matrices, but in, in graphs, um, you would, for example, have an adjacency matrix, right? That, that, that would relate which vertices are, are neighboring. Or you can have, have, have other type of uh, matrices. For example, uh, you could have, have a matrix that has edges uh, on, on one dimension and the vertices on one dimension, and then specifies which vertex is, is, is part of which edge. And, and all these matrices are quite typical for graph structures. And you define your convolution operations, message passing operations using these type of structures. For example, Laplacian, the graph Laplacian would be an essential um, object that you work with in graphs. So, right, and here there is this uh, the, the K partite structure is kind of broken by including these uh, uh, these edges from you know rank zero cells to rank two cells, um, kind of. Right. Um, I'm not sure if I should do this, but I think I think I will just just for a second. Okay. So I will define this a little more mathematically concrete. Um, so I will speak about so this combinatorial complex CC as an object that is a triplet S. Here I call it X. And the rank function. And then, um, but, yes, so this is my set. Okay. This is basically the elements that I have. These are just the nodes for set. And then you can, from this, you can think of the power set, PS. Uh, I don't know power set. Everyone knows power set. So, of course, power set represents all sorts of relationships that you could have uh, given the nodes, right? Because it, it's, going to, it's going to be contained of multiple sets uh, that, that specify all sorts of pair, pairings and you know pair of quadrants or whatever of, of the elements, elements in X. Good. Now my X will be a subset of this power set. So it will specify 
only a certain part of relationships. So this is sparser than the power set itself. Right? So power set is a complicated one. Okay. And now, so if, if I had actually these uh, kind of these maybe two things, um, I might be talking about a hypergram. But now there is a rank function, okay, which is defined as as a, as, as kind of it specifies these inclusion relationships. If if then so let's say uh, if x and y are two elements of x, okay, which is uh, which is this uh, subset of uh, PS. Well, I I also ignore the and set but you know, and, and um, now if x is included in y because these are sets right because they are part of x then that means rank of x should be less than or equal to rank of y so this is basically saying for example um, it's, it's quite easy to understand it. so vertex is a rank zero object right and that vertex is contained in this rank one object that is an edge okay so since that vertex is contained that means its rank should be smaller than the rank of uh, the edge so this is building up a, a, a nature of high okay so and and from the total complex is this so I want to define some best specific operations on that one. Just so that you understand. So there's there's a very nice mathematical description um, of this. And you can see examples of it. Right? Uh, you can do you can do an exercise, right? Uh, so there are there is uh, my set is now um, S is S0, S1, and S2. Okay. And now you specify by some kind of an X the relationships uh, between them. And obviously, you see in the first one, for, or for instance, <clears throat> the S0 to S2 relationship, for example, is not included. That means that all it, we are not spanning all the relationships that we uh, need. Right? And similarly, for, for all the other uh, for, for all the other things, you can see that there are now edges that are not contained uh, in any higher order phase. Um, and there are high, you know, there are high order faces. Well, there are faces that are that have order higher than two. Um, for example, in C. In C. What is the advantage of uh, taking a general rank function rather than taking, for example, say rank of x being equal to the cardinal of x? Well, you specify. You do get some. You get a general. In the sense that you can specify different kind of rank functions, and it becomes an art form to choose your rank function, uh, and then you can divide more interesting like this. It's it's related to orderness currently. Uh, okay, so let me let me go to this. So the, the, the neighborhoods, right? Um, there are higher order. So what I'm covering here is the higher order neighborhood structure. So if you have a point cloud, as you see on the left, and you see that there's a there's a red point, uh, which is like the center point uh, of that local neighborhood. Maybe. If you were to do it in the typical sense, if you were to do a point cloud processing, you would, for example, retrieve the k nearest neighbors and then connect uh, this point to each one of them, right? And then you would say, okay, this is like the neighborhood is 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 whatever points would remain inside a certain uh, epsilon mode. But now you can have a structure that 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 has the edges as well. So your neighborhood is defined by the set of edges. Let's say remaining in the first hop or the second hop, uh, plus the set of vertices. Now you can go beyond this. Uh, and you can you can have triangles now, and now your neighborhood is composed of well all the kind of uh, well right so all the triangles and then uh, the points and then the edges. Now you want to of course 
define this in, in, in kind of a unified way. So what you say is, uh, let's say, you, you define some kind of a K neighborhood, right? Uh, which is the neighborhood of rank K objects. That's the neighborhood composed of only rank K, so just the vertices, or, or the one neighborhood, which is just the edges, set of edges, and then the set of triangles and so on. Right, so now your now your neighborhood structure becomes interesting. And then you would like to communicate these things. Um, so this is me trying to abstract away uh, a lot of technical details, but uh, you could easily imagine. In fact, let me do it here first. So let's say you have whatever you see down there is like a um, simple graph ish thing and with faces and the faces you see that they are these are oriented faces so you know from which vertex to the other you if you had a mesh for example this would determine the orientation of the surface normally um but you know ignore that for the moment that they are oriented um so now you can think of these boundary matrices that relate rank zero elements to rank one element rank one element is an edge so now I'm relating in, in, in delta with one, so the boundary matrix one, um, the vertex one, zero to the edge zero and one. Is it included? Well, yes, it is included. And how is it included? Is it, you know, is it in, the, in the direction of the specified orientation or uh, in the opposite? Right. So you can specify such a matrix. And likewise, uh, that two, you could specify well a, a boundary matrix from edges to triangles, right? So from the edge zero one to triangle zero one two three one zero one three. Okay, and then uh, you encode. So this, these are the matrices you work with, uh, actually. So these are like the boundary matrices, um, and if well, if you if you encode these matrices, actually, you could define what is called a K Laplacian, or equivalently, people call this the Hodge. If you ever heard about this Laplacian, the Hodge Laplacian, which is this interesting object, object that is uh, so BK is a is a neighborhood matrix that goes from K to K plus one. Okay, and so right, and then so. Or, or sorry, k to k minus one, and then the k plus the b, b k plus one goes from the, uh, the the cells, the k k plus one cells to k cells, right? And then you, if you do this simple linear operation, you end up with uh, a Laplacian matrix um, that is a layer of the rank of the coordinates. Okay, so that's a that's a rank dependent Laplacian. So you know in which higher in hierarchy level that you are working with you have so and interestingly you know when you have a Laplacian in the graph we take its eigen decomposition eigen vectors eigen values etc and uh, they, they give you hints about the connectivity structure and the interesting structures about the graph uh, right uh, or how how uh, I don't know how connected or how how sparse it is um, here. The eigen properties, uh, I should say, or spectral properties of that object um, gives you an idea about the holes and about you know other kind of topological properties, like relates to better numbers and so on. You know, and for 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 such a simple uh, complex, you see on the left, um, you have this type of a um, Laplacian matrix. Like this is. L up and L down, and your Laplacian is basically a sum of those. Good. So now we define the neighborhood structures. There's this one last thing to do. How do we do message passages? Because now I just talked about a K neighborhood. So rank K neighborhood, right? So there's the, there's a neighborhood composed of vertices, there's a neighborhood composed of edges and, and faces and so on. So what you do. You just gather those neighborhoods individually, and then you do a within neighborhood aggregation. Means uh, you do your 
you just the vertices kind of aggregate a message in themselves. The edges aggregate the message in themselves. And then from these different neighborhoods, you once again combine the information, whichever way you want to combine. Um, and now you come up with the final message. Right? So just like in a graph, but we kind of defined a you know a rank K or, or you know rank and real message passing uh, stick. And you know, mathematically it's also quite simple. You just instead of one aggregation, you kind of do two kinds, two aggregations with a neighborhood and across the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. When you group them according to semantics like this, like vertices together, edges together, mm -hmm. are you even some local definitions? Very important for, for example, representing three pictures. Like uh, vertices, close edge, communicate first kind of structure. Does it make more sense in terms of shape representing vertices and edges? The spatial engineering part, right? Like vertices and edges but, are there. Like, the but you do that, right? So this type of a neighborhood is like, there's again a special neighborhood. But all the vertices, like, it's very really global, right? But if, if you increase your local neighborhood, to a very large epsilon, it also becomes global. True, but they don't talk to any edges, for example. Nearby edges become less important than a far away node node, if you like sense. Do you see what I mean? I thought the far away node first as a node rather than a nearby edge. Yes. In the side of it. Isn't it helpful for local shape representation? I'm thinking like no, you, you talk you talk to the nearby edge rather than distant vertex, yes. But you Group vertices together, you group edges together. The vertices are also grouped over. Yes. Okay, so again, simple operation. So now we have to do one pooling, and I find this very remarkable. So, pooling operation, you know, whichever domain uh, you use or whichever domain you are in, is a higher order message passing. Even the image pooling. So, what you do, is you have your grid, you have your pixels, let's say, as you see here. Okay. And now you just invent these higher order cells, the blue ones. The blue ones, I'm just image pooling here, by the way, as an example. So the blue ones, I just introduce them as higher order cells that kind of relate a, a larger or, or a more interesting neighborhood of, uh, of the image. And now I pass all these messages from. Um, from these individual pixels to this higher order cell, and then aggregate information within that cell, and then pass it back. Now, the, the, and if your aggregation is, let's say, the max operation, then you kind of recover max pooling because whatever remains inside this uh, new higher order cells is the information, is, is the pooled information you, you compute. So, pooling is very natural. And you just need to you know, introduce this. Additional dimensional um, traces and then best information. Good. So, so far I just covered message passing and pooling, and I'm pooling, so it's also similar. Um, and you can, I think, uh, think about more operations, and I, we are still developing uh, further deep learning operators on these things. Um, well, you can also get a very nice sensorial representation of this. Here, each color is, is, is a color given to a rank. And then you can draw your diagram very nicely uh, as, uh, as information transfer from these uh, between different ranks. OK. Um, we put a lot of effort on this. I mean, it's a crowded team. So we were able to develop some kind of a nice software package. In fact, three packages. One is called Topo Model X, Topo Net X, and Topo Embed X. So Topo Net X is like um, HyperNet. Uh, so it's it's the basic structure to work with any like simplicial complexes, sad complexes, and combinatorial complexes. Um, even hypergraphs we have some support. And then uh, Topo Model X or Topo Embed X is the, the 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 library of these deep learning operators that we developed. And Topo Model X are actually the, 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 the actual practical models uh, that we develop to solve uh, different tasks. So, for example, well, and then we organize this ICML challenge um, in topological deep learning. 
and a lot of people submitted a lot of interesting implementations and you know they kind of contributed to the package it's growing uh, slowly uh, but consistently i should say and it, you know this thanks to this nice canceling representation you could visualize your architectures uh, in quite simple ways uh, in the abstract quite simple um, and you know these are just some models uh, that we already have we don't have really the really deep models yet also we did not uh, do a lot of skip connections and you know, things like that um, but it's very easy to use uh, usually so you, you just define your whatever complex you is, is your favorite complex and then you can even convert existing data sets to these complexes and uh, get the whole plot machines and all these all these operators and yeah, or, or, or simply define a side complex neural network on it uh, and uh, whatever you want. So of course it's it's a, it's a unifying library, right? It's kind of graphs, meshes, and point clouds, doesn't really matter what you are doing. Um, so you can apply it to different things. Well, even for actually graph analysis, uh, we see that. So let's say if you have I don't know, such a graph, right? Um, this way, right? If you have such a graph, maybe one interesting thing that you, you, you want to consider, well, you can, kind of, of course, treat this as a graph and, and do all the GNN stuff, but you can realize you can just run a simple algorithm and kind of detect cycles in this graph, right? And, and you realize that, oh, there's a cycle. But, so if, maybe if there's a cycle, there is kind of a you could convert maybe this to a face. This, this is called different. So you can take any graph data set, apply some kind of a simple algorithm to visit it in a higher order uh, sample, okay, or combinatorial. Um, and then you can use this library. And we actually did that, did that. And even for, for graphs, uh, we kind of get everything. But of course, there are a lot of uh, you know very strong uh, engineered architectures for meshes and graphs. We are only on path, and I think this is a good result. I'm 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 hopeful about this because you know we don't do any specific operation. We don't know even how to do that. Um, so that, that it, it, it's great that we actually get uh, something in the state of the art uh, in these tasks. And so you can, well, of course, you want to do diffusion models, for example, and it's the last thing I show. Um, well, you can again, you can have a molecule, and then you can kind of do this cycle tracing trick that I just mentioned, and then lift it to a um, combinatorial complex. And then um, you can easily define a diffusion model. So graph diffusion models are usually defined as diffusion models on vertices and edges. Now you simply have the Laplacians and adjacency matrices for all of these uh, higher order uh, Laplacians you have or higher order neighborhoods you have. So simply just run your diffusion models uh, instead of one uh, running on one Laplacian, you run it on multiple Laplacians. For one adjacency matrix, you run it on one on multiple bound matrices. Right? Um, so we tried it, uh, and and you can you can in fact uh, get interesting higher order so it's molecules. So it, you, you don't just generate the, the graph, the molecule graph itself, but you also generate uh, the, 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 the hyper cells that they are attached to. And that's interesting um, because uh, now you can speak more of the um, structure of the molecule. So it's a more structured uh, recovery. And I don't have a lot of um, quantitative results. This is just on par. We did not outperform any graph discovery benchmark yet. But there are some teams uh, working on it. Some people are working on the doing transformers, uh, and some people are working on fusing this with other modalities, right? So maybe this is maybe this is not the holy grail, but this is an added source of information um, to any other architecture you have, and so on and so forth. And also, the structure is not like the discovery, right? So usually, and this is, yeah, so yes, so here in the training data, uh, the structure is given and you learn it, you learn the diffusion model. And then, of course, you can run the diffusion model in a generator method. 
and value journeys. Yes. 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 But of course, uh, during learning, you need the structure. So one of the things that I'm really excited about, so you just give me graphs. Yes. And I would kind of detect the higher order structure as I learn it. So I only detect the higher order structures that are really essential. Maybe not all higher order cells are uh, you know. How is this stuff related to community detection? Yeah, so there are a lot of, um, yeah, I mean, this is not something that I'm really interested in, but it's true that there are a lot of connections to that. Also, mathematically, there are connections to operator theory, category theory, and you will probably see a lot of category theory in there, which I don't know, so I will speak of them. Um, yeah, or, or yeah, it's usually coming from algebraic topology, right? So there are also that type of connections, and people want to solve uh, PDs with those. Things like that, so that because you know it can be more, more, more complex domain, how would you solve the PD on this domain by your network? So, you know, these are all problems that uh, I don't know and they are still unsolved. So, yeah, there are many open challenges if you want to work on. Yeah, I just listed one of some of those here. Yeah, I think I'm done. <laughs>